Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the fourth uh, seminar in our series of journalism in uh, literature. Today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Kedor Glaser. Professor Glaser received his PhD from University of Iowa. His teaching and research focuses on media practices and performance, with emphasis on question, press, responsibility, and accountability. Among his books include Normative Theories of the Media Journalism in Democratic Society, which in 2010 won the Frank Luther Moncapa Tau Alpha Award for the best research-based book on journalism and mass communication, the idea of public journalism. Custodians of Conscience, Investigative Journalism and Public Virtue, which it won the Society uh, Professional Journalist Award for the best research on journalism among other. Public opinion in the community consentive, media freedom and accountability. His research, commentary, and books review have appeared in a wide variety of publications, including the Journal of Communication, Journal of Studies, or the Critical Studies of Mass Communication. In 2002-2003, Professor Glasser served as president of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication. He has also held visiting appointments as a senior Fulbright scholar at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He has been affiliated with the Stanford Modern Thought and Literature Program and Stanford since 1993. Without further delay, please let me uh, welcome Professor Glasser. Thank you. Thank you. I won't uh, mess up the camera work if I pace around a little. Oh, yeah, no. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to a group of people who appreciate the connection between journalism and literature. Journalists themselves don't always appreciate that connection because journalists are in a position where they need to justify their activity, their enterprise, in terms of describing the world and describing the world impartially, neutrally, objectively, and and so on. And I try to make the case in a course I teach each fall called Perspectives on American Journalism that descriptions in journalism aren't necessarily and always interpretations. That the world can't be described independent of interpretations of it or to borrow from Edward Said. There is no disinterested account of the world. All of our accounts of the world are based on the intersection between knowledge and interest that we know the world based on our interests in the world, and journalists historically have a particular set of interests, but they're masked, they're mystified to the extent that journalists insist that they describe rather than interpret. Um, having said that, let me talk a little bit about what motivates me to come to the topic of tonight's presentation. This afternoon's presentation, I should say. Um, it has to do with the intersection, the connection between ethics and accountability. So I'm going to argue today, and this is a, very much an ongoing project. A colleague and I uh, wrote about it a couple of years ago, published a paper, and I have a PhD seminar devoted to the topic this quarter, the relationship between ethics and accountability, particularly in the application to journalism. So I very much welcome your suggestions, your comments, your feedback, any suggestions you might have about making the presentation, the claims more clear, and the application to journalism more clear. But basically what I want to do today um, is make the case that the best way to understand ethics, particularly in the context of journalism, is by equating it with accountability. That to be ethical is to be accountable. To say I am practicing ethical journalism um, is a tacit agreement to submit your conduct to pu public scrutiny. Public scrutiny in, in ways I'll describe in a minute. Um, there are two reasons why I want to, I'm particularly interested in applying this to, to uh, journalism. One, the argument I'm going to make about ethics is an effort to democratize ethics, to remove it from the professional realm, to separate it from expert knowledge, right, so that no one's in a position to claim that being ethical or being, or knowing what's ethical is a specialized form of knowledge that only professionals have access to. That's exactly the argument I want to argue against, that we all need to participate in debates about what's ethical that professionals can't trump the argument by parading out their credentials. So I, I want to take the democratization of ethics seriously, which is important to journalism because journalism presents itself as a vitally important democratic institution. So in some sense, I want to call their bluff. 
I want to say, if in fact you regard yourself as a key democratic institution, and all the mythology about American journalism right, is grounded in that proposition, that, that journalism is a key democratic institution, then I want to invite journalists to take ethics seriously as a democratic process, as opposed to a top-down process. Two, I want journalists to see this as an opportunity to create a model for accountability they can apply to others. Very much, journalism is very much committed to the proposition um, wrapped up in, in the, the notion of a fourth estate, a watchdog role, an adversarial press, a check on power, um, that journalists function in our democracy in a way that allows them to hold others accountable, but not themselves. Right? The press is the single most neglected beat in American journalism. Journalists, by and large, don't cover journalism. And more seriously, there is no sustained tradition of journalism criticism in journalism. And that's not to say there's no good press criticism. There's some wonderful press criticism in magazines, online, in books. So I don't, I don't mean to suggest there's no press criticism and there's no high quality press criticism. There is. But there's no press criticism where it's needed the most. And that is on the pages of the newspaper where there is a question about performance and practice. Right? Or on television where there's a question about performance and practice. So you pick the newspaper, and you can take the local papers, and they're good examples of decent-sized newspapers, although it's shrinking given the recent economy. But the San Jose Mercury News, the San Francisco Chronicle, I can't think of the last time they had a column criticizing the Mercury News or criticizing the Chronicle and certainly not criticizing them in a way that invited a response from key editors and reporters. And that's exactly the dialogue, the conversation, the deliberation I want to advocate in my notion or my, in my attempt to equate ethics with, with accountability. For those of you who are philosophically inclined, let me pay my intellectual debts um, with, without blaming the philosophers for what I'm about to say. Uh, much of what I'm going to be talking about today is a creative misapplication of the work of Jürgen Habermas, particularly his idea of communicative ethics or discourse ethics. And when I say a creative misapplication, it's, I'm taking all sorts of liberties with Habermas, but I think it's, it is fair to describe my presentation as neo-Kantian in the sense that it takes Kant's tradition in deontology, um, which is a, an emphasis on process and procedure, and moves it from Kant, who is monologic in his approach to resolving ethical um, disputes with his categorical imperative, and moving it into the realm of discourse, deliberation, discussion, conversation, the things that Habermas wants to take seriously. So I want to try to do this um, in four parts, if you'll, if you'll bear with me. First, I want to make the claim, uh, I want to explain a little bit about what I mean by there's no accountability in journalism. And I want to try to explain that uh, with reference to what one author calls the central image of the free press and journalists' visceral attachment to autonomy makes accountability very difficult. So essentially the argument I want to make at the beginning um, is that autonomy trumps accountability. That journalists are so preoccupied with their independence, so preoccupied with their autonomy as individuals, as an, in, as an institution, that they can't take accountability seriously. Accountability would be a violation of their pledge to autonomy, freedom, and independence. That's the first part. The second part is an argument about where ethical knowledge, where ethics comes from, and I want to make the claim following Habermas, Gadamer, and others, that ethics begins at the level of common sense. That ethics is not a, a, a theoretical form of knowledge, it's not a formal knowledge, it's the kind of knowledge we pick up from experience, that most of us know simply by living in the community what's right to do. It doesn't require any specialized training, any special expertise. That common sense accounts for ethical knowledge. But, this is the third part, common sense is fundamentally flawed. Right? It's not a systematic form of knowledge. It's full of incoherences, it's full of contradictions, it's full of tensions. And so we need a way of rehabilitating common sense. So we want to begin by taking common sense seriously, since that is in fact how we know right from wrong, good from bad. But we need to repair it. And this is where Habermas's discourse ethics comes in. Habermas outlines a procedure for us that we can use to rehabilitate common sense. And then finally, I want to conclude with the ideal of the reflective practitioner. The practitioner, in this case, the journalist who's able to think 
in action, able to reflect on conduct in a way that will improve the quality of conduct over the long run, even if we can't resolve particular ethical disputes at any particular given time. But the process itself is worth embracing because the process is a pedagogical interest. It's a way to learn to reflect on your conduct. It's a way to learn to submit your conduct to public scrutiny, the kind of justification that Habermas advocates in his, in his discourse ethics. So that's essentially the outline. So let me begin then with this sense of no accountability in journalism and what it means and where it came from and what its consequences are. There's a very good book out called The Images of a Free Press. It was written by the president of Columbia University, Lee Bollinger. It came out in the early 1990s. And Bollinger makes an interesting claim and an interesting argument about what journalists regard as the central image of a, of a free press, very much tied to Supreme Court rulings, particularly rulings that favor the autonomy and independence of the press. Bollinger argues, in effect, that journalists like to think of themselves as loners, as skeptics, a kind of bohemian in society, who stands outside society. That's part of the notion of being independent, untainted by influences, doesn't know anybody, doesn't want to get close to anybody, doesn't join organizations. The journalist as loner. And this is very much tied to the libertarian view of the First Amendment that most journalists embrace. That, that a free press is, as a Wall Street Journal editor once put it, a genuinely free press is a press free to be irresponsible. And if you look at the Supreme Court cases that journalists typically celebrate, it's those cases which gives journalists extra latitude, extra breathing room. So a famous libel case in, in 1964 argued that what we need above all else is a, is a robust, uninhibited press. And journalists took that to mean a robust, uninhibited press meant right, the absence of accountability. That I, I'm not obligated in any way to explain what I do because the process of explanation is itself could have a, a chilling effect. That the process of explanation can be coercive. So journalists are reluctant to participate in any forum, any forum that holds them accountable for their conduct because to do so is to run the risk of codifying standards that journalists don't want codified. So let me explain a little and give you some examples of, of what I'm talking about. And it's very much peculiar to the United States. There are Western journalists all over the world, for example, that embrace forms of accountability or live in societies where accountability as a tradition is taken much more seriously in the United States. There are a number of models that have been tried around the world and a number of models have been tried in the United States and almost all of them failed in the United States. So, for example, the idea of a national news council or even a local news council. There was, during the 1970s, a proliferation of local news councils, including one here in Redwood City. A news council was essentially a collection of individuals, usually half journalists and half lay people, who would sit together in a public forum and discuss press per performance, respond to complaints, and offer a ruling that had no legal binding, it was in no way legally binding. It was simply a way of right, engaging in a public discussion about the press performance. The press participated on a voluntary basis only, which is what in the end killed off these press councils. Most newspapers and TV stations and radio stations simply declined to participate. Um, the longest running press council was the one in Minnesota, which collapsed about two or three years ago after a nearly a 25 year run. And the problem with the news council in Minnesota was it was Minnesota's best kept secret. There was a survey done a few years before it collapsed asking people what they think of the Minnesota News Council and they found out remarkably that 87% of Minnesotans didn't even know it existed. All right, so if it, you don't know it existed, you don't know where you can take a complaint, you're in no position to right, take that seriously as a public forum for discussion of press practices and performance. Now journalists never, not only were they reluctant to participate, but they were very reluctant to cover the Minnesota News Council in, in anything analogous to their coverage of the state legislature, the city council, where they would assign a reporter and it would appear the next day. Instead, they waited for a press release to come out two months later, and they would run it buried inside as a news brief. That was their coverage of the News Council. So even if the News Council had a fascinating discussion of press practices, a fascinating give and take between journalists and people who were complaining about journalism. Right? It wouldn't get much in the way of public coverage, which diminished substantially the public scrutiny aspects 
of, of a news council. There was a national news council that began in the mid-1970s and lasted until uh, the mid-1980s, funded by the Ford Foundation and other sources. It was intended to monitor national news media as opposed to regional or local news media. And there it was, based in New York, the New York Times refused to even acknowledge its existence, which more or less killed it off unilaterally. I mean, how could you have a news council devoted to coverage of national news when our premier newspaper wouldn't participate? Other magazines did participate. It did last for 10 years. But when the New York Times was invited to come and discuss their stories, they simply didn't show up. They just simply didn't show up. And of course, they weren't in any way compelled to do it. It was their choice. But their choice was simply to abandon that as a model of accountability. Another model of accountability in the United States that's been tried and so far has failed and failed miserably is the ombudsman movement. Reader's representative, appointed, hired by a newsroom of the 14, 1500 daily newspapers in the United States, fewer than 30 have ombudsmen. Fewer than 30, and of the 30, only two that I know have that I know have have any independence. And that's the one at the New York Times and the one at the Washington Post. Although the Washington Post is going through some changes, and the New York Times has not made a long-term commitment to that position. In fact, that position was created only recently in response to the Jason Blair scandal a scandal a few years ago about a young man who fabricated a bunch of stories. As a result of that controversy, that scandal, the New York Times put together an internal commission, and one of the commission recommendations was to appoint a, a public editor. The public editor at the Times and the public editor, I think it's called the Reader's Representative at the Washington Post, are hired on a non-renewable contract, which assures them some independence. They don't have to worry about keeping their job. Most ombudsmen Right, are by and large senior editors on their way to retirement. They play the role of ombudsman for a couple of years. And the ombudsman's work in those cases turns out really not to be journalism criticism as much as it turns out to be journalism public relations. It's an effort by right, someone in the newsroom to explain how the newsroom works. And often they'll, they'll rely on, on uh, explanations from management that they simply pass on. And it may be you know, explanations from management that have nothing to do with pressing issues in journalism. A popular complaint that ombudsmen respond to around the country is, why does the ink rub off of my hands? Um, or what happened to my favorite comic strip? Or things like that. And you know, to the extent that readers want information about that, readers representatives are obligated to provide that, which waters down their role substantially. Most ombudsmen, most of the 30, and we're only talking about 30, will write a weekly column, but most of the weekly columns are devoted to either explanations, not justifications, explanations about what happened, or that kind of give and take. They'll cite a reader's complaint, they'll go to an editor and say, what do you think about this? And then they'll issue a one-line ruling. I agree with the editor, or I agree with the reader. It doesn't amount to much in the way of a sustained discussion about press practices and performance. And even if it did, we're only talking about a couple of newspapers that have done it with, with any success. And if you take a look at the public editor column in the, uh, in the New York Times, you'll begin to, to appreciate that although the editor, the writer of the column, has tremendous autonomy and authority to write about whatever he or she wants, there's no obligation on the part of editors to respond. No obligation on the part of editors to respond. So when it comes to very sensitive issues, they'll the public editor will contact the executive editor, uh, the editor of the Times and say, what happened here? And the response is simply, I can't talk about it, or I don't want to talk about it. They're not compelled to respond, which of course weakens greatly the idea of accountability when the hard questions are simply not answered. So if you remember back, I think it was 2005, the NSA spying scandal, where the New York Times disclosed um, that it had a story for over a year without disclosing it. They sat on a story for a year and the executive editor was asked, why did you sit on it for a year? What other stories are you sitting on? Will we ever know what stories you're sitting on? And Bill Keller, the executive editor at the time, just simply declined to comment. And so the public editor ended up having to write a column based purely on speculation. You know, what might have been on his mind? He wasn't going to talk about it. So the really interesting questions are, are the questions that more often than not don't, 
but don't get it dressed. Journalism is very much unlike almost all the other professions in the United States in that it does not have, never has had, an enforceable code of ethics. Now that's not to say that they don't, they don't have codes of ethics. There are codes of ethics all over journalism. Almost any newsroom of any size will have its own code of ethics. All the specialized groups will have codes of ethics. So a group of uh, feature writers or managing editors, there's a, uh, a large uh, umbrella group called the Society of Professional Journalists. has a very good code of ethics. But none of them are enforceable, which distinguishes journalism from law, it distinguishes journalism from medicine, it distinguishes journalism from plumbing, right? Um, you know, any form of licensing, you know, one of the requirements for, for licensing is a way to remove someone. Right? Now, you may argue that the processes aren't very effective and there are too many incompetent physicians left practicing medicine, too many incompetent lawyers engaged in lawyering. But the fact is that, you know, given enough time, given enough effort, and given enough money, Right? We can try to remove a lawyer from practicing law. We can try to remove a physician from practicing medicine. You cannot remove a journalist from practicing journalism, and for good reason in the United States, right? It's called the First Amendment. You know, although there's a lot of debate about what the First Amendment means, whether the free speech clause in the First Amendment is, and is redundant with the free press clause, or whether the press, press clause really singles out an institution that deserves special constitutional protection. The fact remains that journalists regard the First Amendment as protecting them in ways we don't protect other professions. It insulates journalists from outside pressure, isolates journalism from society. All right, so even if we could demonstrate convincingly that journalists violated their own code of ethics, right, there is no penalty. There, there are no sanctions. There's no way to prevent someone for from continuing to, to do journalism. In fact, there's no way to even require that journalists have a code of ethics. That's simply a professional courtesy. So although almost all the codes of ethics in journalism invoke the public, right, by reference to journalism as a public institution serving the public interest, the public has no participation in the creation or application of code. The public is not consulted when it comes to deciding what goes in the code, and the public is not consulted when it comes to dealing with the consequences of not abiding by the code. Right? Also unlike the other professions, where the public does get a chance to participate in what constitutes illegal, immoral, or unethical, <coughs> unethical conduct. Um, so again, this is not an argument about enforceable codes, it's simply an argument about what distinguishes journalism uh, from other professions is the fact that there's no enforceable code. And that's very much a part of the mythology, the lore, the folklore surrounding American journalism in the United States. And you see that play, playing out in movies and television programs and plays, you know, this sense of you know, what Bollinger was calling that central image of the free press, where the press is, is free to be irresponsible. And that has, a, that has a lot to do with the press's resistance to things like uh, codes of ethics. And this finally ties to the point I was making earlier about the absence of any tradition of sustained criticism. And again, it's not that journalists are opposed to criticism, but they're not very receptive, not very welcoming to criticism of their own house. All right, so where will the press be covered in the newspaper? In the business section. Right, you'll see business stories about the press or in other sections of the newspaper. But what you will not see or see very, very rarely is the kind of sustained day in and day out coverage that journalists that journalists commit themselves to with reference to the beat system. The beat system is the deployment of personnel in American journalism assigned to key institutions in society. So journalists are always assigned to the police department. They're assigned to government. They're assigned to institutions of higher education. They're not assigned to the press. Right? Very few newspapers, the LA Times for a long time, did have the press defined as a beat, and a guy named David Shaw covered the press and covered it pretty well, and as a result had no friends in the newsroom. Um, but that's the exception, and you can find a couple of exceptions, but the tradition in American journalism is not to take the press seriously. Not only as a beat, that's one thing, but, not, but also on the op-ed page, where essays appear about uh, 
commentary about the day's events and issues, where you see commentary about politics, commentary about business, commentary about policy. You very rarely see commentary about journalism, and if you do, it's either at a high level of abstraction or it deals in general terms with the national press. Very rarely, as I said, will you see local criticism of the press. And it's not to say that there aren't people around who could do that kind of criticism, even from outside the newsroom, but I can't think of very many editors who are committed to inviting that kind of discourse. And then finally, even if you did find occasionally a column that criticized local practices and local performance, I can't remember the last time I saw an earnest response from the staff. Here's my justification for what I did in an attempt to create the conditions for a conversation about press practices. So that you know, sums up briefly and crudely my sense of why accountability in journalism is a very difficult thing to, to achieve. And in the absence of a good transition, let me move to the second part of my presentation. That is this notion of common sense as the source of ethical knowledge. So let me explain what I mean by common sense and, and then connect it to this idea of ethical knowledge. And this borrows a little bit from Habermas but mostly from an anthropologist named Clifford Gertz, who has a wonderful book called Local Knowledge, and in that book there's a chapter on common sense as a system of knowledge. And that's, um, I, I found that very interesting and a very useful way of understanding the logic of common sense. Gertz and Habermas and Gadamer and others make the point, which I find compelling, that common sense is always practical. Common sense is always practical. It's not theoretical. It's not abstract. You don't study it in a book. You don't go to the library to figure out what common sense is. Common sense is practical. We learn common sense in, in an effort to respond to everyday problems. And so I want to use that as a way of arguing that ethical knowledge is always practical knowledge as well. But first let me outline what I mean by common sense, a little more detail um, uh, based on uh, Gertz's understanding of common sense. Common sense is the kind of knowledge you gain through experience. Right, just by virtue of living in the community, you acquire a degree of common sense. And we, can, we can talk about the general community. We can talk about specialized communities, too. In any specialized community, you pick up common sense, not by studying, but by doing. By doing. There's a, a wonderful writer for The New Yorker named uh, Altul Gawande, a Stanford grad, who went on to get his MD at Harvard and is now a Harvard surgeon and writes periodically for The New Yorker. And he wrote a, an essay which later it turned out to be a section of a book he wrote on uh, how he goes about selecting surgical students, you know, what he looks for in surgical students. Now keep in mind that medicine, unlike journalism, comes in two parts. There's a formal knowledge you need to master to be a surgeon, right? So we assume that, that a surgeon knows anatomy, right? So we, we assume that when they open you up, they can tell the liver from the kidney. So there is a formal, systematic knowledge that we expect surgeons to master. But after that, there is a, the kind of knowledge uh, at the level of common sense that we expect them to master, but not by going to the library, but by doing, by doing, by doing. And Gawande goes on and suggests that the surgery students he's most interested in aren't the ones with great manual dexterity, the, great, you know, the ones with great eye-hand coordination. He wants the boneheaded student who's willing to do the same procedure day in and day out, day after day after day, until they can do it in their sleep. Right? So he wants to see somebody who can tie a knot without thinking about it. He wants somebody to be able to do a surgical incision, right, rote. You know, that, that idea of muscle memory. I've just done it so much I can do it in my sleep. That's the sign of a gifted surgeon, assuming they got an A in the net. Now in journalism, it's very different. Journalism, and I say this with some frustration being a journalism educator, there is no formal body of knowledge that needs to be mastered, or if there is, there's no consensus on what it looks like. All right, so if you, you look across the curricula at, at journalism programs in the United States, it's easy, it's difficult, near impossible to find that common denominator. What do we think journalists need to master to practice journalism? Rather, journalism is more like a craft than a profession in that sense. And the, the, you know, the claim that I would make about journalism education, you know, this is a claim that I'm going to be making on Friday during Admit Weekend. Um, journalists don't need a journalism education for the same reason, right? Poli politicians don't need a degree in political science. Um, business executives don't need a business degree in 
Um, great novelists don't need an English degree or a comparative literature degree, and you certainly don't need a degree in criminology to rob a bank. <laughs> there are things that you just learn to do, and, and that's why journalism is so, so much built on apprentice internships. And even our program here, you see that. And there's only so much we can teach you in a reporting um, course. We'll send you out on internships and hope that some of the wisdom of the newsroom rubs off over, over time. So, you know, Golwande's explanation of the kind of, kinds of surgery students he wants reminds us of the everyday application of common sense and what it means to us, you know, the kinds of things you've learned as a, as, as simply as a matter of practice. And as a matter of practical consequence, you had to learn it to survive. You know, think about teaching a, uh, a kid to ride a bike, or a baseball player on how to hit the ball, or, you know, a little kid learning how to tie a shoelace. All right, you can bring out a manual, right? You can show the kid an instructional, instructional video, and it probably won't make any difference at all. I have no reason to believe that will improve the success of riding the bike. What do you end up doing? You put the kid on the bike, kid looks terrified, I remember this from, from my own daughter, I'm going to fall, and all you can say is, yeah, you probably will, <laughs> but you'll get back up, and in a short period of time, miraculously, you'll be able to do it, but you won't be able to explain to anybody why you're able to do it, which is why when you ask a baseball player, why is it that you're able to hit the ball last week and not this week, you know, they have a term for that, which explains absolutely nothing, I'm in a slump, right? slump is a word for, I have no idea why I did it last week, and I can't do it this week, but I know there's a problem. And, and what will coaches tell them to do? Go back to practice. You know, hit the ball more often. Hit it again and again and again. And if that doesn't work, we'll fall back on some superstition. Right? Move your hat or you know, hit your cleats with the bat twice rather than once. You know, wh whatever is going to work. These are things that are difficult to explain. And explaining them won't matter anyway. So you can get a physicist or somebody in physiology to explain the movements of the batter and explain why he's missing the ball. It's not going to help the batter hit the ball very much. So this, this notion of common sense, Gertz suggests, is above all else, obvious. Right? Common sense is obvious, the kind of knowledge we have. You've been in the community long enough, you know you don't have to hit somebody over the head with the bat. Right? It's just common sense. Um, it's, it, but when you move to a different community, common sense can sometimes shift. Because Gertz, Gertz makes the point that the form of common sense transcends community, not the content, just the form. Not the content. And so I remember the first time I went to England and saw people driving on the other side of the street, <laughs> my visceral reaction was wrong, not other, wrong. I mean, it, it was just obvious to me. It was a matter of nature that you drive on the right, right hand side <laughs> of the street, not a matter of convention. It was natural, which is exactly what Gertz claims for common sense. It's natural and obvious. Right? It's also accessible. And anyone living in the community has, a, has access to common sense. You don't need special training. You don't need to be especially smart. You just need to have your eyes open to pick up common sense, right? You just live in the community long enough. And it, you, again, it can be the specialized community of a newsroom where you become socialized into the norms of journalism, the conventions of journalism. Or it could be the, you know, the, the larger community called the United States. You know, think of what's common sense <coughs> here that wouldn't be common sense elsewhere. Anyway, Gertz goes on and on to celebrate common sense as a system of knowledge we don't take seriously. As a system of knowledge we don't take seriously. And we ought to take, serious, ought to take it seriously um, because it accounts for so much of our knowledge, particularly what Aristotle called practical wisdom, right? the kind of everyday knowledge we need to survive in our community. And although Gertz doesn't go one step further, Habermas does when he argues that common sense accounts for ethical knowledge. That ethical knowledge is an aspect of common sense. That most of us know what's right and wrong at any given time. We don't have to stop and think about it. We don't run to the library to consult a book. We don't reflect back on what we read about Kant to decide whether we should cheat or not, or abuse somebody or not. We may rationalize it away. And there are times when someone will contest our, our ethical judgment. And there are times when there'll be disagreements about what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. And Habermas' response to that is what I was earlier referring to as an effort to democratize ethics in the spirit of common sense. And Habermas's claim then is when something is disputed, when something is contested, what we need is a, an open process 
accessible to everyone affected by the conduct, open to everyone affected by the conduct, um, in an attempt to achieve a consensus on the validity of that norm, on the validity of that norm, whatever that contested action, that contested conduct might be, to achieve a consensus among everyone affected by the conduct, not just professionals. You know, keep in mind that most codes of ethics are written by professionals, for professionals. And Habermas is arguing here that ethics understood at the level of common sense, all right, any, any process of public justification, any process of public scrutiny needs to be open, not simply to professionals, but to everyone. And all that matters in that process, this is key, all that matters in that process is the quality of the argument. The quality of the argument. What gets bracketed entirely, what's entirely bracketed, are credentials. Credentials cannot enter that process. No one can enter that process and say, I have a PhD, you don't listen to what I'm saying. Habermas regards that as coercive. Right? What you're supposed to be paying attention to is the quality of the argument. It doesn't matter who's saying it. What matters is what's being said. That's the essence of discourse ethics, the essence of communicative ethics. The quality of the argument prevails. Now you can imagine the, the practical limitations to this, and this is what my, my graduate seminar is focused on um, this quarter. How in the world do you make something like that work? Um, there was one critic of Habermas who argued that Habermas's discourse ethics is so utopian as to be little more than a philosophy of anticipation. He anticipates a consensus. What do we do until that consensus arrives? And think of the big moral, ethical questions we face in society, not just in journalism, but the larger questions we all come from. You know, think of the biggest ethical dilemma in medicine, life. When does life begin and end? You know, the debate concerning euthanasia, the debate concerning abortion. All right, that's not going to be resolved anytime soon. No, one can, no one's anticipating a consensus tomorrow morning on that. Habermas's response to that is an interesting one. Those are the conditions for more conversation. Those are the conditions for more deliberation. Those are the 